Well, they say the circle of life uh, presents people in our lives at the most strangest places. And I met this young man. His name is Devin Studstill. And I had no idea of his background. I just knew that uh, a special guy, uh, great conversation. And of all places in Austin, Texas, he had no ties to Austin. But what I, after peeling back the layers, the guy was an accomplished college football player. But his skills and his intelligence, intellect goes way beyond football. And he has ties to a fan favorite head coach who had a short stint here, that being Charlie Strong. That's coming up on episode 97 as we count down to the century mark of episodes here. And as Charlie Strong said, let's ride. Wake your ass up or take a damn nap. And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. It's time. You were tw- I mean, Sean, you were twerking. That's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Murph, don't be a dick all your life. This is uh, one, of, one of the more fun podcasts I've ever done. Hey, I'll tell you what. If you're not talking about sports in the man cave, you... No, I bet not. So you're not a man. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Notre Dame would like to welcome to the Fighting Irish family, Devin Studstill, defensive back, Riviera Beach, Florida. Studs Steezy, my man. They have been talking about this young man since he was little. Excellent player, came to the Irish invasion and, you know, really wowed us. Leader, mature. Episode 97, Devin Studstill right here from Florida, currently in Austin, Texas, you and I met, of all places, a hole in the wall in Austin, Texas, a place <laughs> called Boulevard Bar and Grill. It's it's honestly one of my favorite hidden gems in Austin. And we had a short conversation for about 30 minutes, an hour. And, man, here we are. We talked about this podcast, Devin, and by way of Florida, your home state, Notre Dame, and South Florida, you're here in Austin, Texas. Welcome to Stories Inside the Man Cave. Hey, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. 100%, man. It is amazing how certain people are brought into our lives. And, you know, we're going to peel back the layers, learn more about you. And I'll set it up this way. Uh, Devin uh, obviously signed with Notre Dame and doing what so many players do. They find their homes. That's what we, that's the story of life. We find our path, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And you end up Mm -hmm. in South Florida where Charlie Strong after his tenure here at Texas, our stint ended. And then you were coached by head coach Charlie Strong. And right now you're in Austin. Just tell the folks who are listening, whether across the nation, here locally, what brought you to Austin? Man, what brought me to Austin? <laughs> <laughs> so like you said, I'm from originally from South Florida, West Palm Beach, Florida, to be exact. Uh, coming from all the way from South Florida, I went to school in Notre Dame. I uh, saw the opportunity, had to run with that. Uh, what's crazy is Toast Strong recruited me and courted me in the whole recruiting process there on in Austin. So I came here. <laughs> I was 17, 16 on 6th Street with uh, Kenny Vaccaro and some of those guys and having a great time on 6th Street. And I was like, Austin's cool. <laughs> so uh, I experienced Austin when I was 17. And then I always had Austin in the back of my head. And then uh you know, transferring my third year, my junior year to South Florida, Coach Strong, we had strong ties, so I ended up going there with him. And I got a career opportunity from a great person here, Rex Gore in, in Austin. And I was like, I already know what Austin's about. It's a great town. So if I could start anywhere, I want to start there. It's a great right. tech town, entrepreneurship-wise, and I want to lay some new roots in the ground. Yeah, that's a, you hit the nail on the head about the tech. You know, the tech industry here, Austin's booming business wise, great opportunity for young people and old people like me, too. I think there's still opportunity as <laughs> as an entrepreneurial side. But before we dive into the football piece, um, mm-hmm. what is your plan? I mean, you when talking to you, I was just impressed. I could see that there was a direction that you have a plan. Mm-hmm. What's your ultimate goal? I mean, do you think it would remain you will remain here in Austin as as far as business plans for you? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I got a master plan, and I kind of want to keep it close to vest, but <laughs> a ten a ten to fifteen year plan about what I want to do. I really want to change some things as far as uh, fitness goes, and 
in some of those kind of areas, I kind of want to create communities. I don't want to, I want to be the person behind the fitness community. I don't want to be necessarily jump around and spend next time I shut off all day. I want to make sure that people are getting integrated and I keep people knowing what it is to make small increments each day. So I just want to combine tech, combine working out, combine community and make it all one. That's going to take some time. So I'm right. just keeping everything close to the best as I can. And then when it's time to go, it's going to be fully at you guys for sure. Yeah. You know, what's funny. You, you say that you have a plan and you're patient, uh, a mutual friend of ours who was a position coach at South Florida. It was actually here at Texas briefly, Trent early. He said that yes, uh, sir. great guy talking about you, that you always have a plan mm -hmm. you, and you have a great story. When, when he says mm -hmm. you have a great story, what else is he referring to as far as taking? Obviously, we know you're an intelligent guy with a business right. acumen up here. But what, what, what is he? What was Trent talking about? He says you have a great story in addition to everything that you and I have discussed so far. Man, you want to tell my story. I mean, you got to start with people that came before me. So my family is a great aspect of my story. My father played for... West Virginia quarterback, um, won rookie of the year there and did well, played in the Cotton Bowl against the Gators, went 12-0, and 0, wow. and that was my father. Um, and so that his greatness, his his legacy kind of was instilled in me and my little brother. And so football was a family trade is what we did. We woke up in the morning before school, got on the beach and worked out and went after school and ran after practice and did everything you possibly can do to get better at the game of football. That's how he talked to us. He talked to us in terms of football, but it was more so life lessons, but we always got it through football, of course. And then um, the story kind of picked up, dealing with some great uh, adversities at Notre Dame. Started my freshman year, played all 11 games, thinking I'm hot stuff, you know, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing great. In 2017, I had, a, I, had some, I had my mother pass. 2017, my coach left, I got a new coach in. Dealing with all those things as far as mental health goes, anxiety, depression, grief, all at the same time, new coach comes in. I don't feel like he has my back. So now we're we're butting heads. And so the pedigree and the athletic ability has always been there, but it's also putting together, okay, what's my plan? And putting together, okay, I got to deal with these different kind of personalities to get what I want for sure. You know, you hit on something that I feel is still taboo in our country, and that's mental health. Correct. Uh, mental illnesses. If I, I, I want to go ahead and say this, Devin, it affects mm -hmm. us all. Correct. But so many people are so afraid, and, and I'm not bashing anyone. It's just people are afraid to speak up and say, you know what, I'm battling depression, battling Correct. bipolar disorder, or anything. Right. Why do you think, or what do you think it's going to take? Because I think you guys, as a former student athlete, have a, a tremendous platform to speak mm -hmm. out on things like that. There's a numerous things that. And I've seen tremendous uh, people accomplish tremendous things, b them being student athletes who have given back and really stood for something. As far as mental health, what do you think it's going to take before people realize it's not taboo? It's a, we're human. So right. Oh, man, what's it going to take? I mean, that's a loaded question right there. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, I think it starts off with knowing what's going on with you. Like, we don't know what you're feeling like. Because 2017, 2016, I was balling, but I felt crazy. Like, I felt things weighing on me. I felt things I couldn't express. And I just felt really trapped inside of my own thoughts. And it would, it got back to a point where it was hard for me to compete. Every, like, only thing that mattered in my life was competing, was the game of football. But outside of everything else, it was really give or take. It, anything could happen, you know? Right. Uh, and so me, Notre Dame did a great job of showering me with therapists when my mother passed, gave me three of them. And I used all three of them like each and every day to figure out. And so it became like a, it became my new passion where, okay, I know nothing about this field, but it affects me. So how can I do enough research as I can to know what I'm feeling and, and express that? And then I, how do I know when to see it when my brother or when my someone close to me is feeling those things? I know it was really going on with you, bro. You could talk to me about that. Like, let's really talk below the surface. So it's having those conversations and knowing what to bring those conversations. I think that's where you start at, for sure. Yeah, it's always the that first step. And yeah. I think that once people take that, 
And I think, here, you know, if, and, and to add another layer to that, I think a lot of people get caught up. Um, college football, let's take that for example. Correct. I'm only in my second year being a fan. Been, having been in the media for so long, I wasn't able to really be a true fan. So I hear the things, and I know people don't mean any harm, but they – they see college athletes as these individuals they praise and put on a pedestal, mm -hmm. but overlook the fact they're human. They're normal and, human beings. And, and it's the simple fact that you may – just because your level of play decreases one Saturday or through a few weeks, that you may be going through something, experiencing Correct. something. Um, and that's why I asked, you know, it's, I know it was a loaded question, but it's something that, we as a society or I guess as human nature probably need to embrace a little more and try to understand, all right, that's not a piece of property. That's a human being who probably is going through some similar things that everyone else is. I mean, is that, right. do you kind of feel that way too? Yes. And it's, it's very delicate. I would take that in a, in a de more delicate sense where it's like, okay, well, first of all, you're a human being and you're not a pawn. That's one. But then you're putting your product, like the product, of football that's like your passion that's your art so like you're sensitive about it like i put i'm, I'm naked out there i'm out there i could get hurt i could all these variables could happen eight thousand people are watching me each and every time i go out there if i get burnt this guy on twitter is going to talk about me so it's like it's me naked on the field and you need to take that into account when you on your twitter account so when you're when you take consideration when you're criticizing take that into account that hey this guy may just have midterms this guy may have some real family happen you know something like that that's funny you brought up twitter social media in general it's a great <laughs> resource and you know oh, that being a, a, a an entrepreneur learning your way through that that mm -hmm. space it, social media is a great resource for it but when charlie strong was here uh, I remember he said uh, Twitter is, a, you know, social media, the downfall of society. Did he ever mention that to you guys? Because he had some one liners, some <laughs> quotes that has, you know, will stand the test of time while he was here in Austin. Right. Coach Strong was a he's he is a, he's not was a, he is an old school throwback coach, like traditional 1984 five, like get it in camp period 24, <laughs> like. Long practices, long camps, and just tried and true ways of going about things. And, yeah, that's that's him all day, every day, for sure. You kind of gave us a hint of what it was like. I know for a fact that there were some uh, – you know, he recruited some great DBs, a defensive-minded guy. Mm -hmm. But everybody seemed to love Charlie Strong. And you got to play for him, what, two years? at uh, Or three, I can't remember, at UCF. I mean, USF. USF. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we don't mess with the nice. Uh, we I talked to him. I played for him two years for sure. Okay, what uh, what did he leave? You know, coaches all leave some type of mark, permanent mark on us that really carries through, mm -hmm. helps us through life, like these nuggets of wisdom, so to speak. Charlie mm -hmm. to me was just the most approachable person, and funny, hilarious, right. comical, but also. The guy was quiet, but he was also when he spoke. I, I felt like, man, he you learned a lot whenever he mm -hmm. spoke to him one on one. Mm -hmm. Is that the same he way was, he was realized? Yeah, he's he's just a very genuine person, and you don't get that in college football. Like when you get recruited, you know, it's always going to hear the same spiel. Or you're the <laughs> like you're the best thing since sliced bread, right? But then Coach Strong talks about you like, hey. You're good, but I want to make you a better man. And you come here, I'm trying to make you a better man. You see that, like, it's not him talking, it's action. And it's, like, right. it's reputable. It's whoever, like, because he has deep roots in South Florida. That's the only reason why I came out to Texas, because I, I heard about him through XYZ mentor. So I heard about him. I said, I got to go visit who this guy is to, just to figure out who he is in person. And everything, everything you hear about him checks out to the T. And even a little bit more, he goes beyond his way. I could still call him up right now. I don't know if I could call up Brian Kelly, but I could definitely call up Charlie Strong and he'll answer for sure. So, <laughs> that's how I go. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about college football, the current scene, because I know you, you probably find time now to be a somewhat of a fan nowadays, but we'll talk about that in segment two. Yep. Um, 
the, my favorite part of segment one with uh, our guest, and there's been some legendary stories, the man cave story brought to you by Jim Saxon State Farm Insurance Agency here locally. Um, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our other sponsor, Cosmic Coffee and Beer Garden on the south side of Austin. I think that's where you and I probably need to meet, uh, meet up for lunch or a midday pick me up, so to speak. It's, uh, <laughs> it is old school Austin its finest. And to be honest with I'm talking about they're going to host our and I'm showing my age here, Devin, our 30th high school reunion here pretty soon. That's awesome. that's crazy. So, yeah, we'll, awesome. we'll visit there. So the man cave story, obviously your choice. Is there one story, whether it be your football days in the locker room, on the field or in a game or, or something within your family or your friends that you love telling people that you laugh about nonstop? Like Rod Babers in our previous episode, when his short stint in the NFL, he was talking about, you know, he was on the same team as Jerry Rice and he would go to the steam room and that's where he would gain the wisdom from the Jerry Rice in the steam room. Two grown men in a steam room just talking. Got you. <laughs> man, there's so many stories and so many good times. You think about that locker room that we had in yeah. 2018. It was filled with star-studded talent, man. It was just good moments all the way around. I don't know if I could say <laughs> one moment. It's crazy. It all flew by, too. Hmm. That's a tough one. Yeah, it is. I would say my, my most memorable moment, I would say probably was my first moment playing down in Texas when we played Texas and we ended up losing. Yeah. Well, I didn't have any business playing. I, <laughs> <laughs> my hamstring was jacked up from camp. The guy that sat me in front of me ended up getting kicked out. So, And the guy was a senior grad transfer, so I'm thinking I'm not going to play. So I am just enjoying the scenery, enjoying the cannonballs, and enjoying Doak, uh, Doak Stadium and then uh, Doak Campbell. And then all of a sudden, I'm in the game. And so after I'm in the game, is we're going against Big Swoops and Bouchelle and uh, Matt Truck, 18 Wheeler. <laughs> the, the Matt, oh my God, the 18 Wheeler, man. It, can you believe that that year, both of you guys, Notre Dame and Texas, Ended up with losing seasons. Did you did you even see that when you guys left Austin? No. Was, did you even see, see that as an option or, or would be a the reality of it all? No, not when you're going through it. But in hindsight, I could definitely tell you yes. In hindsight, looking back, when I could I could definitely feel a losing season like during camp. But when that's my freshman year, so I'm fresh yeah. out of high school, so I don't know. I don't. Know, I'm green. I don't know what's what. <laughs> Man, it's a uh, little did you know, a few years later, man, you'd be returning to uh, what I like to call God's country, the ATX, Austin, Texas. And yes, Devin Studsfield is now trying to carve his way into the tech industry and implement uh, a fitness idea that I think you find the right investors, man. You're going to have tremendous success here. There is no doubt. Making this your home base. Yeah, so for speak. sure. Um, we're going to take a quick break. But on the other side, Devin Studstill and I will talk what's what in college football currently. And maybe he'll talk about the Longhorns. And I want to bring up a certain NFL football team that he has. Well, I don't think he has any ties to and get his take. They call Arlington, Texas home. That's coming up on the other side of this break. For all of your insurance needs, look no further than our primary sponsor, Jim Saxton State Farm Insurance Agency. The ATX OG has been insuring Austin for over three decades. And get this, Jim Saxton is a Longhorn legacy. He is the son of the late, great James Saxton, who was a Heisman finalist. Be sure to give him a call or better yet, visit his website, saxtoninsurance.com and tell him that the stories inside the Man Cave Boys Recommended you.
All right, segment two with the Devin Studstill by way of Notre Dame, South Florida, and he is a guy that I, I see. If you ever meet this guy, you see a promising future immediately. Just how you carry yourself. That's, that's what I noticed immediately. I'm not just saying that because you're on the podcast today, Devin. Uh, it, for people to follow you, which uh, social media are you the most active on? So right now, I'm most active on Instagram. My Twitter got hacked. I'm trying to get that oh. back. Yeah, I'm trying to get that back. Blue check and all, they got me. So I'm a, I'm on Instagram right now oh. at studsteezy, S-T-U-D-S-T-E-E-Z-Y. And that's all my handles for all my accounts across the board. That's that's smart. Make it all consistent like that. At uh, Man, that's bizarre. I, I, there's too many people with too much time on their hands hacking people's accounts. I don't get it. Man, it's crazy. It. it's crazy. It really is identity theft i don't well uh, i don't want i want to keep it positive here on, on stories <laughs> inside the man cave and not get frustrated uh you saw you saw the little tease there about longhorn football have you had a chance to watch texas play at all this year i went to a game actually their first game so when you watch them play louisiana it was raging cages they were ranked at the time mm -hmm. did you see anything that would remotely lead you to believe that Okay, that's a great first half team Texas has, but second half is just totally opposite. Like the the, the opponents seem to out coach or make better adjustments because Louisiana did make a comeback, even though Texas, you knew Texas was when they made that surge in the first half, the game was over for the most part. But did you see, did you have any inclination that Texas would be two different types of teams every game? No, I didn't. I, that was the first game of the season, so you can't really get a good read on them. Um, but I seen a team that was definitely just young. Yeah, I could tell they're just young across the board. They have some great pieces. I think Sark is a great offensive mind. Also, my guy Ovia Gofu from Notre Dame is at University of Texas right now. I forgot so, about that tie. Yeah, yeah. So watch him. He got a sack that game too. So that was yeah, great. Yeah. I just think they're I just think they're very young. So like so some of those things that will arise now as you say those, like some of those problems will will arise definitely for sure. So you've seen a lot of football. You've been on you played in a ton of games from all levels, from your pop warner youth football all the way up to college and professional. Do you I mean, from what you know about Texas and I'm just focused on them because we we do a lot of uh, cover Texas and discuss them quite a bit. Um, do you, the, do you see from the pieces they have, you've seen the scheming that Sark and that staff does. They do a tremendous job for what they have. Mm -hmm. Are those correct as a player from a player's point of view, former player, is this all correctable to where they can experience growth to be able to compete with those high level teams that they have lost to because of those second halves? Right. No, I'm excited for them, especially on the offensive side of the ball. I like that running back a lot. Yeah. I like that running back, I like that quarterback. I think they're like one like top tier level receiver away and then just developing those pieces along the board. Because all those are all those players that we mentioned are young players. Yeah. So it's developing them, watching them grow, and just getting an extra piece here, extra piece there. You know, Shark likes to Shark likes to take the top off of defense. So you can't really do that right now. So he's spacing them out and running the football really well right now, which is good. Yeah, and, and I think you know all too well. Those games, yeah. regardless of what scheme or philosophy, they're all one in the trenches. And Correct. I, just, I mean, I guess you see it too that they're struggling offensive mm -hmm. line wise and defensive line. The talent's not deep enough. Mm -hmm. is, is that kind of the evaluation you have made as well? Yeah, that's the evaluation I made. No one really popped out to me when I watched them, but I'm sure they got some guys that are capable of playing just to just those reps and that time on the field is invaluable. So, it might be some guys that that's very well that are some dogs, but no one popped out to me that game that I watched. It's amazing because uh, when you look at teams and the maturation process, is there an example from maybe your Notre Dame or South Florida days where you didn't see a teammate experiencing the success? You didn't see that happening that maybe he experienced the latter half of a season? Right. Yeah, you see all the time, especially not even Notre Dame, but even with the Bamas and the Georgias or the SEC teams of the world, how most of those guys haven't even played the first two years. 
next thing you know, it's just next guy in motion, next guy right. up, you know, and they're that deal because they waited and they took their time. Um, what I would say is just that that maturation process of actually taking the red shirt year and just figuring out who you are as a player, figuring out who you are as a person, that's going to do a player justice. So when it's time to hit the field, it's, it's clicking. There's no time to go out there and stumble. It's, it's, but that takes a great program, and it's, it takes some time, too. I feel yeah. like no Texas coach really had time no. <laughs> as of yet. No. Like, give somebody some time to actually get some things in motion and get something – stable it just hasn't been stable so you picked up on something really quick that has been systemically wrong with the program here at texas and i'm not trying i'm not asking you to criticize texas but it's just the fact there there's zero patience here mm -hmm. it's, it's money whipping people to bring mm -hmm. them in and right you you can't really blame charlie you can, it's it's a collective effort of adversity that a program has faced since 2009 even when mac brown was here his latter years mm -hmm. i mean what do you if for as a former player who played at a high level what would you tell these texas fans to in addition to patience to give this guy and this staff a chance man you, you gotta let football be football you know that's like you being somebody say you're a doctor and then you got a banker making your decisions based off money like nah, football is an art. Like yeah. all the all the boardroom and all the boosters. Like y'all could have y'all say as far as outside the stadium and marketing. Like y'all have that, but right here on between these gridiron, like between these hundred yards, fifty yards wide, like we got this here, and like let us handle this. Well stated, my friend. Um, you mentioned Alabama; they've suffered a loss mm -hmm. at A and M. Mm -hmm. Um. Do you see Alabama storming back and winning that national championship again? Or who, who would be, as of today, your college football playoff as far as the four teams and, and who, who would be your national champion? Or do you see some program rising up and getting into the playoffs by winning their conference championship? So, yeah, I'm going to do it by conference. That just helps me out. Like, yeah. just think. So as far as for the SEC, they're going to have at least maybe one or maybe two teams in there. Yeah. I like the way Florida's playing. I like the way Georgia's playing. And Alabama has to – now Alabama has to beat Georgia to get in. So yeah. it's going to be crazy because Florida and Georgia has to play. So it's it's going to be a good, like, matchup this year at SEC, like, a very competitive. And so what I think I get one team or maybe possibly – I would say two teams from the SEC in there. Um, Clemson's not doing that well this year, as you see. So they're out. The Big Ten has a competitive conference. They're solid. They're solid. And so it's room this year. That's what makes this year so crazy. It's, it's a lot of room for everybody. Yeah, I looked at one time is last week, I believe last week, there were five Big, Big Ten teams all went in or outside of the top ten collectively. They're loaded. And it's unreal, man. And it's not all Ohio State. I think Ohio State's beatable. And they're yep. talented extremely talented um because you face some guys like garrett wilson who ohio state has you know some talented receivers and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. how would you other than lay in the wood of the you know to neutralize big time receivers like that how would you go about it i mean because that's the type of challenge you like as a player facing mm -hmm. guys like that yes and i was 175 my freshman year soaking wet so it was me and <laughs> It was me and the receivers, and I would study like tendencies and which step they, which foot they put forward, and their body language when they're not getting the ball and when they're getting the ball. So it was little things like that that I would prepare for as far as receivers. But I mean, if if you have a dog on your team that you could put on him one on one, like put him on him and let him yeah. be a dog. And then if he needs some help, bracket him sometimes. Maybe cover two brackets on third down plays and maybe inside shade from the back or on third down plays for the slant. Just give – if you're going to have a corner out there that's not that good, then give them one way to go, you know? See, that's what stories inside the man cave listeners and viewers want to hear. That's what – this is the content people want, the inside knowledge of a, of a uh, high-level player like Devin Studstill, man, because you played it, you've seen it. That's like a mm -hmm. foreign language to most people. Mm -hmm. and that, that, is, that is what we – it gives us an insight on what's going on as far as uh, the secondary goes. Now, 
one thing I've noticed this year, I know this is really random, Devin, but uh, this storm in the field in college football, that wears me out. There's been <laughs> so many fans, students storming the field. I get it. Some of these are big wins, and I've been witness to, I think, three. I probably saw it three times my entire life. I saw it. I went up to Arkansas. They did it against Texas. And there's another one I'm, I'm leaving off. And then I saw it at the Cotton Bowl Stadium, Texas OU. A proud program like Oklahoma, who has owned Texas the last decade. Mm-hmm. And they stormed the field at the Cotton Bowl. I mean, what you, I mean, I know a big win is a big win, and you're feeling like you're on top of the world as a player. But what's uh-huh. your thought of the? Uh, I mean, like the SEC finds these programs a hundred grand for their fan. They still oh, find these fans for going on the field. I mean, as a player, this modern day and age, you don't know what people have. And I know there's metal detectors, but you never know what the intentions are nowadays. Mm-hmm. That, what's your thought as a player? Were, and were you ever on the field when your fans or opposing teams fans storm the field? Yeah, we never had the big win where our fans stormed the field. <laughs> Even though he went, he went twelve and zero one year, but our fans yeah. never stormed the field for some reason. Whoa. Yeah, it was crazy. But I mean, we got the field stormed against us. That Texas game we lost, they stormed yeah. the field. Um, that NC State game we lost, they stormed the field. So it just depends on the school, I guess. If it's a if it's a championship for the school, then they'll go out there and they'll act yeah. like they never won before for sure. <laughs> I just. I get it when a team like the other night, uh, I understand. Appalachian, Appalachian State won. They upset mm-hmm. uh, Coastal, Coastal Carolina. Mm-hmm. I get that. They beat a ranked team at home. I get that. But we're seeing it so often nowadays. And I'm just like, wow. I don't know yeah. why. I don't want, I hope it's not me being an older guy just <laughs> against it being too traditional. But man, I'll tell you what, one team that I might storm the field for. I don't know, but it, it would probably – I don't know. Yeah. I'm trying to think Who would you storm the field for? That's a great question. It may be these guys right here. <laughs> if I'm at Arlington – I've been there 17 times, Devin, at, at the Cowboys State. I've never been as a fan for the Cowboys. Gotcha. If they won a championship there, let's say they won an NFC championship, I may storm the field. It, you know, I may and, and probably go to jail for it or get, you know, arrested for it. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> but that leads me to the question, as a guy who knows his football, are they true Super Bowl contenders, the Cowboys? The Cowboys look good this year. They look good. They got that defense going. Diggs is playing out of his mind Woo. right now. It's, it's special. It's greatness. Like, if whoever's on this podcast and you pay attention to football, please watch seven every game. He's doing some things that you'll never see this generation. He's he might be that guy. He just 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 might be that guy. So Dak is I, doing well. Yes. Yes. Dak's on another I, level, bro. I mean, it's unbelievable. And that old line is cohesive. Old line always been stout. And, and when Zeke, I hope Zeke kind of takes He's starting off slow, and that's good. He might hit his form around that fall, November, December time. He might hit full form, so that would be great too. So you mentioned Diggs and being a DB yourself. And I know we just see the TV uh, broadcast view. What Mm -hmm. is it that he's doing for him to have had so many interceptions already? And we haven't reached the midway point yet. You know what what they always say? They come in bunches. And once you get one, it seems like the ball falls into your hands and he has it going like he's in a flow. And some of those picks are just being in the right place at the right spot. And other is just him just being totally locked into his man technique and really wanting the ball. And then uh, I think Diggs, his his brother, his bigger brother, I think they did a great job this offseason preparing. Like, I love their story. I'm a Diggs brother fan. Like I, I love them for sure. It's it's tremendous, and if anyone uh, doesn't really know the whole story, it's all over the internet. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a great story, feel good story, and uh, it's it's pretty amazing that entire family really. And, and it's his that's his son, right? That the little guy. So, yep. So it's the, it's 
It's Diggs. Stefan Diggs is the big brother, and the little brother is Trayvon Diggs, for okay, sure. Yeah. Stefan, yeah, and it's, it's amazing, the football family. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to jinx anything because I've been a cowboy ride or die <laughs> for my entire life. And gotcha. we've been through 20 plus years of hell. Yeah. Um, uh, Dak did catch, I mean, Dak, Dez did catch it, by the way, in 2014 or whenever that 15, <laughs> he did catch it. I'm still bitter. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. We have a set. I'll, I'll go ahead and throw this out there now. And I hope it does not come back to if the Cowboys falter and it's my fault on this projection here. Uh -huh. 17 game season. I'm thinking the Cowboys go 13 and four because, you know, mm -hmm. regardless, teams are going to go through a slide. It's mm -hmm. hard to pull a Tom Brady and the Patriots kind of run. Maybe 14 and three. And I say they go to the NFC Championship game, and that's all I'm going to say for now. Wow. I got um, another prediction for you. Who do you okay. think they win Thanksgiving Day? Do you think they pull that off this year? And they're playing Detroit, correct? I think so. I got to yeah. check. I got to check, too. I'm just so used to them playing uh, Detroit. I think so. I, I, I think this team is uh, much different than the previous ones the last 10 years or eight years. And I, I think there's, they've got this swagger about them and okay. on both sides of the ball, opportunistic. You can give up some yards defensively, as you know, but if you make plays the right time consistently, that's when you know you have something special, and that's what they're doing. And I'm more of a defensive guy than an offensive person, mm -hmm. and I really think that uh, they'll win Thanksgiving. But somewhere they're going to slip up and lose two or three this year. Okay. And, and I – because, you know, 17 games, you, it's hard to stay healthy. Yeah, it is. And I, I can't imagine. That's now, you, had a, you, you did have a stint in the NFL, correct? Tried out for the Vikings, and I was there for three, four days. And then is that, <laughs> tore up my hamstring. <laughs> oh, God. It's, so tell uh, people who – the audience – Mm -hmm. you probably were as talented or more talented than some of the other DBs in the NFL at that time. And mm -hmm. with the team you just discussed that fine mm -hmm. line, what is all, what are all the elements of that fine line between being a guy and a guy who makes it? Yeah, man. And you can say that too, because three of my four best friends are playing on teams right now. And yeah. so it's not – you hang out that's equally yoked, so it's not anything that the athletic ability wasn't there. It's just the circumstance was in the hand that I was dealt. Um, I think it was a crazy year to come out in. And so everything got brought to the surface where it's kind of like yeah. you need to know who's who. Like you need to have people vouching for you in different rooms. So having the right representation, having the right film, having the right winning season behind you, and just having – just those, all, all those things come into factor, especially when you're like 2020, when it was, it was hard to get your face in front of teams. And so they had to go off film, off, go, go off who's who. And so that was a string factor in my process. And a lot of guys got thrown through the wayside. But there's a lot of different outlets. Like guys go to the XFL and arts development leagues now and, and get their shot. You know, I don't think that's the path for me. I'd rather just get started in what I got to do. Are you. Are you done with football or you think there's still a chance for you that you may have that itch to return or, or is that in the works right now? So right now I'm trying to decide, man, but I'm, I think I'm good. I'm good right now. I'm good. It's just the, from a return on investment spot, I could go back to football and give my, I gave 21 years, 22 years of my life to football. Right. And so it's a shot. It's only 1%, 3% makes it to the league and only 1% of that 3% actually plays and makes some money after three plus years and so i got insight through my guys and my best friends and they tell me the real deal about what's going on there and i i know how that game goes and i love the game of football from a passion perspective. i don't want to mix the business at this point i always have my business and do what i do is and keep football right just unfiltered like just keep it keep keep the love for it i don't want to get into all that for sure I, I perfectly understand that. That makes too much sense. You know, that's that short window of opportunity. But like you said, collectively, over two decades playing that great game, man, you uh, you had a great career. 
And mm -hmm. what we like to do, how to end this thing, we love, I love positivity. We all love it. And that leads us to this, the final segment of episode 97 of Stories Inside the Man Cave. Hey, Ben, tell me something good. All right, Devin, well, let's ride. Tell me something good, either in your life, what's going on in the world around you or maybe something that just popped up that, uh, man, you are extremely excited about. Oh man. I'm blessed to be in this city as it's growing. I'm blessed to have my own apartment, my own, everything, just things are looking out. I also see my little brother this weekend at Jackson state playing for Deion Sanders and he's doing a damn good of a job. And so <laughs> watching him do his thing, um, we're getting things in order for the next. He has four years left, so you're going to see me training, and we're going to get him together. We're going to get him ready to do what he has to do, but like, I'm excited for my brother, and I'm excited for myself and things I'm looking forward. I love it, Devin. I really do. And that, that right there, all I can say to add that is we just lost Devin, but uh, to tell me something good, sponsored by Cosmic Coffee and Beer Garden, I'll tell you something good. People like Devin brings a tremendous amount of positivity, great attitude, and, and be sure to follow him on all social media platforms. The guy is has a plan, and I met him at uh, Cosmic Coffee and Beer Garden, and here he is. This is the beauty of Wi-Fi. This <laughs> it happens. It just happens, Devin. Yeah. I, I was uh, – Telling on my tell me something good. I usually have something, but I was kind of elaborating on your story that you know, I the, the good piece that I want to add to it is I have crossed paths with some amazing people with amazing positive energy, and you're one of them. And I know it was a uh, back in the summer, and we finally uh, got our schedules together and aligned, and we got you on the podcast. And I think you have a tremendous story, and all the investors out there in Austin. Um, and anybody who has, who wants to team up and align with Devin stud still check him out on social media, message me, I'll connect you. Cause this guy has uh, he's a brilliant thinker. And I think you're one of those types of your mind's always going, you're thinking of ideas oh, Am yes. I off base on that. No, you're totally right. All I think about, I have to really write it out. When I get home, I have a whole bunch of ideas. I got to just throw out to the wall and just get them out of my head. And, it, and this is a great city, one of the great cities in, uh, in the world, honestly, for ideas such as yours. And, and Devin, again, man, I really appreciate you joining us here. And we're going to have to connect again either at Boulevard or we'll go let to Cosmic know. on the south side. All right. Let me know. I'll be here. I will, Everybody brother. Everybody get at me. Stay easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love I love your social media handle, man. It's uh, legendary in itself, or, or unique, if you will. Yes, sir. For, for the oh uh, man cave stories inside the man cave, OGs, Big Mike, Coach Mo, and Hardball Harge, and for the VIP of episode ninety seven, the Devin Stud Still, we appreciate you, and we out. Right. You see the drippy, I'm fitted up. I'm in my car in the giddy up.